hey y'all here is round three of the tour through the south this episode takes us to charleston south carolina my guest today is my mom's uncle but i call him my uncle as well he is one of the coolest people i've ever met and has lived an exciting life in the continental u.s including many years in hawaii and five years on the island of sicily in italy he is actually the guy I talk about in episode nine, Massimo, who came to save me when I screwed up and missed a train back to his house. He has traveled the world many times, visiting Singapore, Japan, and Northern Africa. He spent 30 plus years in the Navy, has two wonderful daughters, and three amazing grandchildren. I have so much love and respect for this man. His name is Greg Gustine. So what I wanted to start with is you... You lived through a really cool time period. Uh, the 60s. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you were, I mean, you were in your teens, late teens and like early 20s. And that, that chunk of time mm -hmm. that so much happened, uh, what, was, what was that like? Well, you know, I, in the early 60s, when I was, I graduated from high school in 1963. So I was pretty much into that 60s thing. And... Um, I don't really have a lot of memories about that. I mean, I was a pretty tame kid and uh, running around with Kathy and stuff like that since high school. So, mm -hmm. you know, we were pretty much uh, an item and we kind of, whatever we did, we did together, you know, it was pretty cool. Yeah. You guys met when you were like 14, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then you were together. For she was a little bit older than I was. She was 15. Oh, really? Probably three months. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But anyway, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, but what was it like? What was it like having Beatles albums come out? And what was it like seeing Led Zeppelin and then hearing about uh, MLK? Like that was such a turbulent but awesome time period, right? It was, but uh, I don't think socially I, it had a, a whole lot of impact on me. I mean, it was, I've never been a real music guy, you know, mm -hmm. I did a little of the jazz thing, but... Um, I was never a guy that I, I was more into the beat and just the sound than the lyrics and so on and so forth. You know, others, Kathy, she could, she was really into all that stuff, but mm -hmm. the groups and who was hot and who was not. And the Beatles, of course, and Elvis, you yeah. know, they just, uh, I liked listening to their music and so on, but we were playing everything on 45s with a big hole in the middle, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so that was, that was pretty cool. But, um, and then, I followed on the news and things like that, but to actually be, I don't know, involved in any of that too much, I wasn't, that wasn't me. It So even though it was happening and it was in the headlines and everything, it was kind of like a distant thing that was going on? Well, yeah, kind yeah. of, sort of, it really was. I mean, I was going to college after graduating, you know, I went to a junior college and, um, and then went to the big school, the university of, and, um, I didn't do real well when I first got there. I had a um, business background or major, minor kind of thing. And the first semester didn't work out well for me at all. Yeah. I, I just bombed those classes. They, it was awful. It was really awful. And I had a conversation with um, Grace, Kathy's mom. Mm -hmm. and I was just sitting with her and I said, you know, I'm kind of struggling. And she said, well, you know, what do you really like to do, Greg? So I was, I loved sports. So I just said, oh, I like sports and so on and so forth. And so I did this, I went, I changed my major and, re, and started all over basically. And I went to, a, I don't know, I went to one of the professors there that was switching into physical education and he was a football coach and he said, well, son, you know, you got two, two chances, slim and none. <laughs> <laughs> but I made him eat those words yeah, because I did do quite well in it. And I, even though I wasn't a star football player or whatever it was, I could do a lot of things pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. so I, I always felt I was pretty coordinated. And in the end, I ended up having them. Like I said, commend me for my ability, which was, of course, I was going to become a teacher kind of that's what it was physical education and that's mm -hmm. what that's what i thought I was going to end up doing and um so i pulled those things off mm -hmm. 
We, I kind of skipped ahead a little bit and I, I didn't intentionally do that, but, um, so you grew up in Southern California. Yeah. Long Beach. Long Beach. Lakewood. Um, and you lived there up until the time that you went to high school and, and college? Yes. Yeah. The, your entire young life was in Long Beach? Well, not really. Towards the end of my college career, I moved in with a friend down in, um, uh, near the beach with, in, I can't remember the name of the town, uh, Palo, Los Alamitos or something like They built these uh, little canals in there, like boats. And, and we had a house that backed up to one of these waterways. And we had this little sailor sailboat, uh, Lido 14. And oh my God, we just had a blast there. And uh, I had my 21st birthday there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, it was really fun. Mm -hmm. We had a great time. I remember laughing our ass off, getting stuck because neither one of us were very good sailors. So yeah. we, the wind would blow us into the seawall and yeah. we'd just end up laughing about the whole thing. It was pretty cool. And you went to college and like you said, you kind of changed what you were studying. You decided you wanted to uh, go down the, I just knew I couldn't do the business route. Yeah. It was just too much of economics and yeah. all the rest of that BS. I couldn't deal with it. It uh -huh. was just awful. So this got me more into what my life was all about. And then I began working, uh, you know, part-time in summers and so on and so forth at recreational facilities there in the, in the area. So, I mean, I really started that at a very young age, probably 17, 18 years old. And so what year was this that you went to college? <sighs> um, Late sixties, yeah, yeah, and sixty three. I graduated from high school in a couple of years, so that'd be sixty five. So probably sixty seven, sixty six, sixty seven. God, you graduated high school in sixty three. Yeah, I'm an you, old bugger. <laughs> well, the reason I say that is you were a senior in November when JFK got shot. Yeah, I was at Long Beach City College then. Is that that had to be one of those things oh, man, where like, like everybody remembers where they're at, right? Everybody just stood still. The whole world just stopped. It was just weird. It was very weird. I mean, the the, the roads there weren't people on you know driving home from work or doing all the normal things that they did. It was just it was really strange. Yeah, yeah, kind of. I mean, uh, kind of really, bad. It was just horrible, unbelievable, right? Yeah, like you couldn't absolutely. couldn't absolutely. imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what I was getting at is when you uh, you graduate high school in 63, you go to college. Well, college was a different experience back then, right? I mean, how much do you remember how much it cost you to go to college? No. I mean, it was probably what, maybe a grand a year, a couple grand a year? Yeah, somewhere in the ballpark yeah. like that. And um, at that time, my parents had divi uh, divorced. They divorced when I w was in my like third year of college. And uh, so then she moved to an apartment and um, I lived with her for a few months there while I was going to college because it was real close to where the college was. Mm -hmm. And she was working on a golf course and uh, in the pro shop. So, you know, she and she'd always played golf and she was pretty damn good too for a little four foot 11, you know, <laughs> she was tiny. Yeah. She was a tiny little bugger. And, um, so she taught me to play golf. I mean, I'm left-handed. I do everything left-handed. I punted left-handed. I, you know, do volleyball and tennis and all the sports that I played. Everything is left-handed. But golf, I play golf right-handed mm -hmm. because my mom wouldn't let me play left-handed. <laughs> she said, it looks funny and you'll always have a hard time, you know, getting golf clubs. <laughs> so it, it's it was pretty cool, though. Do you ever try to hit left-handed when you go out now? I Just bought a left-handed putter. Yeah? Yeah. And uh, I've been using it in the house and took it out on the golf course once. And, oh, my God, it was like, I better not do this. I better, <laughs> I better practice a little bit more. But yeah. I always thought if I did it left-handed, I, I could do it, you know? Yeah. I always felt like I was pretty coordinated. So yeah. Yeah. I could pull that kind of stuff off. Mm -hmm. So she, she teaches you uh, golf and has a big influence on you in that realm. And you you just decide that you want to go the sports path. But then at some point, what happens with uh, the service in the military? Mm. How does, how does that happen? Yeah. Well, you know, that was Vietnam war then we're talking 1968, 67, 68, and um, the draft was going. So you, you had to get, uh, you got rated with a number mm -hmm. 
And if you, you know, if you had a, a relatively low number, then you're guaranteed you're going to get drafted. M- meaning what? Based on your your physical abilities and no, your nothing age? to do with any of that. It was a random draw. It didn't matter. Didn't matter. Yeah. But what was the age limit? Uh, Eighteen is the minimum age that you can get into the military what, legally. What was the highest age that they would take? I have no idea. Maybe forty five or something. Really? Yeah. Huh? Because I, I had this conversation with my buddy. His dad. I don't think he got drafted, but we were talking about it. And he was under the impression that your name would show up on the TV screen. And I was like, there's no way they did it that way. And I saw something later on where they had, uh, they would do like a, it was weird. It was almost like a game show. Yeah. And they would do a drawing. Like a ping pong ball comes up. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And it would say anyone with the birth date, August 31st Mm. is now enlisted. So at least in that scenario, they chose it by your birth date. Yeah. I don't remember all those gory details, but I do remember the fact that once I I was in my last year in college, so I had a 1A deferment. There were like four categories of classification. And um, so uh, four years, I didn't finish grad. I was six units from graduation, but I didn't graduate and instantly... I got a 1A classification, and which meant I was going to go. I was I was headed out the door to go to Vietnam. I really had a hard time rationalizing how I could be, you know, in college doing, and I don't know, in, a, in an economic world that was so, you know, the United States was really booming. I mean, we weren't, we weren't hurting at all, but mm-hmm. you know, how in the world I got to be 18 years old and I'm going to go in some rights betting and die. I just couldn't figure it out. I, I just, I refused to kind of accept that reality that I might, that might end up and be my demise. Mm-hmm. I, so I started to try to figure out a way to, to avoid, avoid it. That. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a long story, but I can make it rather short. I ended up I mean, all the National Guard units in Southern California were completely full. They had waiting lists for the waiting lists. And so um, Kathy's sister, Chris, was living in Hawaii. And she told me about guys, you know, from Southern California over there surfing and drinking primo beer and having a ball, you know. So I figured, (laughs) hey, okay, let's try that. So I ended up dropping out of school and... Going to Hawaii, and I think I left February 11th, 1968. And um, three months after I joined the National Guard there, they activated the entire Hawaii National Guard. So I went from the frying pan into the fire as far as that. I'd never been to basic training, and the... (laughs) And the National Guard unit that I used, you know, this big old Hawaiian guys with big beer bellies and you can see their toe. And, you know, I'm going to war with these guys. It's yeah. like, oh, my God, this is not looking good, you know. Yeah. But um, anyway, you know, in the long run, it's, it could be a very long story, but I don't want to get into that. So well, so what was that like for for your girlfriend, Kathy, and oh, your mom? Was, like, what did, what did they, what did your family think? Well, mom, I didn't have much input but Kathy and I for that it was a big deal it was it was pretty bad she actually came over and spent some time with me in Hawaii before I left and that was really cool and um um yeah so I went I went to uh, they shipped us over back over to Oahu and to Schofield Barracks and we, we started playing soldier there, but nobody really knew what the hell was going on with us. They yeah. really didn't know what, to, what they were doing. And um, finally, one day they said, okay, you guys are going to Fort Ord and you're going to go to basic training. Fort what? Fort Ord, California. Okay. Which was a training facility for the Army. And, um, and they packed us all up and there was about 60 guys from Hawaii that fell in the same group as I was that were neophytes and hadn't done basic training. So they sent us all over to Hawaii and we, what's a neophyte young person okay. that hadn't, you know, rookies, okay. R- rookie army people, you, guys. you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And, um, yeah, so we all went over there, went through basic training and, um, I, I did pretty well on that. I was physically fit and didn't have any trouble at all. I was, you know, one of the squad leaders there and so on and so forth. And, um, 
then we went to AIT, Advanced Infantry Training, and that's where my mom came back to save me because she had insisted that I took typing lessons my whole time when I was in, in high school. So I took typing classes, you know, and it turns out that um, it, it worked really well for me because I got into a, an admin group in a, advanced infantry t uh, training. I didn't go into, you know, be a gunner guy or something like that. You know, I did, I had an, a kind of an <coughs> administrative route. Mm -hmm. So that was a good thing. So you didn't ever have to go to Vietnam? No, that was kind of a, well, uh, you know, again, I, I, I kind of, this is a touchy subject for a lot of people to the degree that, you know, I got out of going to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I did it fully legally and so on and so forth. But a lot of people that went that. You're saying people frown upon it? Yeah. 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 There's a lot of people that went over there and lost sons and died and so on and so forth. So someone that didn't go or evaded it or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, there was some hard feelings from some people. Yeah, but I mean, that's that's pretty insane that you're just a person living on a piece of land and then someone above you decides you have to go kill people. Pretty much, but that's the nature of the military. Yeah. That's what you're there for. So. But would you, you never would have joined, oh, right? No. No, uh -huh. you, you got pushed into it because of the draft. Yeah. 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 But then after that, you stayed in. And we were in Hawaii. We got transferred back. After AIT, we got transferred back to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. One day, they just kind of turned their mind around. And um, to this day, I think I was I played a role in that. I actually had orders to Vietnam. And all of the 60 guys were divided up all over Fort Ord in various groups. And, you know, and... Um, I went to the first sergeant and I told him, I said, look, hey, there's been a mistake. We're supposed to go back to Hawaii and rejoin the 29th Infantry Brigade. And he kind of went, yeah, right. Okay, Gusty, I get it, you know. Next morning, he came out and he said, your orders have been revoked and you guys are being sent back to Hawaii. Hmm. So that was pretty cool. And that was, a, that was my first dodge of bullet. Yeah, right there. Um, for sure. And after that point, was there any possibility you could get sent again? Or oh, that absolutely. Of, yeah. So what happened when I when we got back, the first thing we do, I mean, everybody in the Army basically is a rifler. I mean, you, you're at some point you could always be, had a gun stuck in your hand and you're saying, you're, you know, you're going out there. But so we started doing that imagery and training in the in the the mountains of Hawaii on Oahu. And I did that for two or three weeks. And then I heard about uh, a new kind of regiment that they were building, a, an admin regiment that would process everybody from Schofield Barracks going in and out of Vietnam. So I had an administrative background. I had a close to a degree. All you know, the typing classes. Yeah, all the typing classes. And I went and applied for the job, so to speak. And yeah, I got transferred out of the infantry and into an admin unit. And in the process of, of all this, every month there would be um, this list of names that would come out of all the people at Schofield Barracks. And if your name was on that list, you were going to Vietnam. Yeah. So we would sit in this big circle of all the people in the office kind of thing. And, you know, and, and we'd be going over the list and look at the guy next to you and he'd be going, oh, shit, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm gone, you know. Yeah. And, 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 but I didn't. I got passed up on that. How, well, first, what was, what was the general sentiment of everyone that was there? Were, were the majority of people scared and not wanting to go that direction? Or were there people that were like... Gung-ho? Yeah. I didn't run into very many gung-ho people. Really? Because well, it seems I was, like, I, I mean, for as long as we've been fighting wars, it seems like that was something that people were proud to do for a really long time. Yep. Uh, Civil War, World War One, World War Two. Yeah. It seems like after two, and maybe like around Korea or something, that's when people started saying, "What are we doing here? Maybe, maybe that's not the answer." It was a political war kind of a thing, you know. Like it was hard to understand what the real rationale was. It was kind of a domino sort of perspective. Well, if we let the 
you know, the uh, communism get here, then it's going to ne be next and so on and so forth. And I think that was, a, I don't know, the, the logic or whatever, if you mm -hmm. want to call it that. But um, now there was, most most guys were trying to come up with ideas of ways they could, you know, get out of it. Well, have you heard the story, the supposed story about Ted Nugent? No. He crapped his pants and yeah. smeared it all over himself and acted like he was crazy. And yeah. he got... Uh, I forget what the term is, but they, they called him crazy. And so he didn't have to go. Right. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> there were, there were guys, that, there were guys that did some weird stuff. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll just suffice to say that there is some weird stuff that went on to try to make them not medically, you know? Yeah. Not, to, not past the, past the grade. What, right. what were other reasons that disqualified you? I, I've heard, I don't know. Flat if this, feet is one of, yeah, yeah that, but that's a World War II thing. I don't know if it's for real or not, but um, I don't know. Yeah, you know, you can ask Trump. He, he, he did something. <laughs> I don't know what, but yeah. there, were, there were guys that did, you know, swallowed tin foil. So it would show up like an ulcer in your stomach. Huh? There was another guy that had his wife come in and just went ballistic. And the officers, you know, and, and in the CO's office and, Got him out. I mean, there's just weird stuff going on. Is that your phone? Yeah, it's my phone. It'll only go for four and a half rings. <laughs> <laughs> then they'll leave a message. Yeah, uh, yeah so uh, everybody's trying to find a way out. Nobody really wants to go. And what, what was the... What was it like for the people above you? Do it, I mean, how did they try to, like, build morale and... I don't remember anybody really giving any Rob Ross speeches or doing anything. We just did our jobs, you know, and, and cross your fingers, hoped you. Yeah, name I learned. Up. I learned. I learned a lot about regulations. I mean, that's I dealt with all day long, you know, Army regulations, and um, so I learned about ways to get out. And so I applied for an early out to go back to school, mm -hmm. which was completely legitimate. Mm -hmm. I had already spent 19 months in the Army active duty. And so I did that and um, I got accepted and I went back to school at the University of Hawaii. Okay, so you, you left California, went to Hawaii, had to go back to California. No, back to Hawaii. But So From, you only came back to the States one time. I never came back to the States. Well, they sent you back, right? To Hawaii. Yeah, okay. So you went back, you're in Hawaii, then you apply to get into the university there so you can finish your last six credits, you said? Yeah. 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 And so what, what did you finish with? What was the degree? I had six units of, of uh, it was in physical education. Mm -hmm. and so at that point you knew yeah. that you were going to continue to, to remain in the military and try no. to take. Well, I was in the national guard. Then I, the part of the gig of, of getting out of active duty, you had to still had a six year obligation. Okay. So I still had to join a national guard unit, which I did in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, that went down pretty well, although it was, you know, and that was the time now in the late 60s, early 70s, and so on and so forth, where things were starting to, then I was kind of becoming part of the world. You asked me younger if I went through these area, times in life where mm -hmm. Kennedy and, you know, and, and all that was going on, but I wasn't really in touch, but then I was on my own by then. And Kathy and I had gotten married. We got married in, um, I don't know, the last part of my AIT okay. came home for a weekend. <laughs> it drove home from Fort Ord to Long Beach mm -hmm. and then sped out of town. And um, Kathy drove up with me back to Fort Ord and then she drove home by herself and opened wedding presents. <laughs> and you had to go back. And I had to go back to the war, but well, not the war, but to the army, you know. Yeah. And, and finish so up. when did she finally join you in Hawaii? Uh, I couldn't say exactly, but um, not too long after I got there, and we ended up finding a, just the most coolest place ever on Mokalia yeah, and uh, on the North Shore. Yeah, on the yeah. North Shore and um, on Crozier Drive, a little three bedroom, two bath house right on the water, paid $234 a month. And it was freaking awesome. That was your mortgage? That was our rent. That was your rent. Oh, I thought you were talking about the house. You're talking about a different it, place. No, I'm talking about coming back from, from Fort Ord. And, no, and I'm saying the house that she lives in now. No, 
No. Okay. No, no, no. It was just a rental that we had. Okay. Yeah. And, um, that was our first rental on the North shore. Actually the first rental on, and I take this back. The first rental we did, we went to a house and we, um, <laughs> yeah, I blew that one. The Rotowalds. Um, we ended up renting a place in their garage. Oh, really? Yeah. They, they built this kind of wall and <laughs> what a trip that was. Oh my God. And we kind of made it as nice as we could possibly do, but they had like a 14, 15 year old teenage kid. And, you know, he'd lean over the wall and kind of look like, hey, what's going on in there, you know? And, yeah. And we had this little door that we would go out and to the shower and the bathroom, which was like a lead. It seemed like a lead wall thing that you'd go into. It was really crazy, but it was so cool. And it was a beautiful property, again, right on the waterfront. Uh-huh. And um, so that's when we started looking for houses and so on and else. And then we found this other house that I was talking about, three bed and two bath. And that's where we lived there by ourselves. Mm-hmm. And that was really cool. I mean, it, it, it was very cool. And you, you could tell at that point that was kind of, we weren't going anywhere. That, that was your spot. You we were weren't gonna, going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. We were there for to stay. It was, it was just too beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So what was that transition? You were, kind of not straight edge, but you kind of weren't involved with the counterculture. You had to go to potentially uh, get sent to Vietnam. You're, you're part of the military complex. And then you start kind of veering off into the counterculture. Mm. You know why? Because it was a nat- natural evolution. I mean, it was just what you did. What I wanted to do is what we wanted to do, you know. That, and the people that we were living next to and next door neighbors and everything out and and it was a it was a very free kind of hip environment yeah that we moved into and it was really awesome along the beach a lot of guys were surfing and so on and so forth I mean you know I I tried surfing uh, before leashes were invented <laughs> and uh, I. <laughs> I went out there on a, on a surfboard in the summertime on the North Shore. It's pretty flat. And so I would go out in these little baby waves and, oh, man, this is pretty cool. You know, I can yeah. do this. And then the winter started to come in and these swells, which to me seemed like huge, but they were only, you know, four or five feet tall. But yeah. I took off on them, on one in particular and obviously fell off. The wave took the board over the reef, and that was a big, I just freaked me out, man. I'm going to get shredded on this <laughs> yeah. reef and so on and so forth. So, I don't know. I finally made it to the beach. I was nauseated, kissed the sand, and I said, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> so, you quit surfing? I quit that surfing. That was it? That was it. Yeah. I did other things. You know, I did windsurfing and hobie catting and uh-huh. so on and so forth. And that was more on top of the water than in the water. And the water can be terrifying. We we were out there, I forget what year it was, like 96 or something. And we were out there on Waimea Bay and a wave came in and caught me in the churn mm-hmm. and I'm trying to swim up mm-hmm. and I didn't know what way was up. Yeah. And I, I went swimming again, obviously, but that was it for yeah. that day. Well, it's, it, Hawaiian surf is, is really different in the fact that it builds up from deep ocean into a shallow you know, reefs and so on and so forth. And that's what makes it, gives it so much power. Yeah. And, you know, a three foot wave will kick your ass. Yeah. It really will. It will. It's not quite like here in Folly Beach, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, anyway. That was it for surfing that one time. That was it for surfing. Yeah. Uh, but I sure had a lot of good time on the, you know, learning windsurfing. That was a big challenge to learn windsurfing. And um, I didn't realize windsurfing was that big in Hawaii. Oh, it was huge. It was pretty much invented there. Really? Yeah. I got a lot, a lot of the guys around where we lived did, were instrumental in developing where the mass step was that goes into the board uh-huh. and having it, making it flexible so you could bend it yeah. either way. And now I went through a lot of things like huh. that. It was, it was pretty cool. We built, we built a, a catamaran out of two surfboards and a pipe <laughs> and, and, uh, one of the girls, uh, wives, uh, made a sail, sewed the sail together, you know, and it was uh-huh. really cool. We, we went out there and we we're just we we're spinning around because it didn't have, it couldn't stay in the water. It didn't yeah. have a grooves or it didn't have a dagger board or anything, you know? So then we figured, so then we, we put a piece of plywood along the bottom of, of the surfboard with fiberglass 
And uh, we actually got the damn thing to go out and come back, but it was never very functional. <laughs> but anyway, after that, then we we got some we got Hobie cats and uh, what's a Hobie cat? A Hobie cat is well, there's 14 and 16 and 18 feet. We had 14s original originally, and you can sing sail though. It's a catamaran, two ponds, or the trampoline that goes over, and then you have a harness that comes down off the top of the mast. You lock in, stand on the edge of the uh, on the edge of the I see. Hull when it comes out, you know, so you're leaning back over one hull is completely out of the water and you're leaning back in that harness. Mm -hmm. It's a blast, man. It's yeah. really cool. So yeah. we, we had, we went through four of those boats and I say we, because by then uh, we had moved to Popeye Loa, which is where Kathy lives now. And, um, but we lived right across the street. So we pulled the beach, I mean the boat up on the beach and just say, okay. And we just put the sail down, wrap it up a little bit. We just, Sometimes, depending on the type of year it was, we tied off to a coconut tree or something, but mm -hmm. otherwise it just sat on the beach. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was basically your own private beach, right? Yeah. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Big time. And what year did you buy that house? Oh, man, that's a good one. Um, it's like 72. Well, Kathy, where are you when I need you? Um, I'm going to say 1987. 87? I think so. I thought it was in the 70s. 87, huh? But, and what would you pay for it? Well, initially we paid fifty four thousand dollars. Fifty, but that was a, that was under lease and leasehold. Uh, it was a big deal in Hawaii, and um, through condemnation, they were trying to change some of the the. There were five major families that owned most of the Hawaiian Islands: hmm. Bishop and Campbell, and you know two or three other ones, and. Um, so this process had been in the courts for like 20 years and all of a sudden they decided that they were going to let some of these lease properties go to sell fee simple, which meant you own the property, no lease, right? So that happened to our group and I think it was kind of a test case to kind of see how things were going. It wasn't very happen. It wasn't happening all over the island. Yeah. But we were, I think, one of the first ones and uh, we passed on the first option that was given to us to buy the property because we just weren't financially really all that well you know yeah i mean hell we bought that house at fifty four thousand with nothing in the bank i mean we're talking nothing the families came through for us and, mm -hmm. you know helped us get through the down payment kind of thing sure but um yeah so but now that house is on a block with multi-million dollar homes Oh, multi-million dollar homes yeah. on the waterfront. Yeah. And on even on, I mean, it's a big, it's a big piece, it's 16,000, over 16,000 square feet. So it's a big piece of property, but the house was built in 1954 and it, it's a four bedroom, th three, no, two bath. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up, I ended up converting one of the bedroom that had been on, added on to the house into an apartment and we started renting that place, you know, from the very get go. Sure. And it worked out good. Sure. And, uh, th there's been, uh, who's, who are some of the people that lived on that block? Is it true that, uh, Lars Ulrich from Metallica? I don't know. No, if, he, it, if that's true, that I don't know. That. Somebody told me that at one point that he lived I know, across the I street. know one of the properties now is owned by, um, God, the number one surfer. What's his name? Um, Kelly Slater? Yeah. 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 He, own, he owns the property on, on Popeye Law. Yeah. Waterfront, of course. It's a beautiful area. Yeah. And it's pretty cool you guys got in there when you did because yeah, it's I impossible mean, now. Oh, yeah. That house is worth over a million bucks. Yeah. That's not it's pretty bad, cool. That's not a bad appreciation. Of course, it's been, what, 30, 40 years? I don't yeah, know. Yeah. But to, uh, to get property on the island like that when you did, that's pretty cool. You yeah, know. it was it was quite an achievement, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, I always thought we were pretty fortunate to pull that off. So the other thing we we must have gone past it at some point that I wanted to bring up was your trip to Europe. Well, that's where I started to get a little confused on the timeline. Okay, so um, after Crozier Drive. And the first house I was telling you about, 234, three bedroom, two bath, blah, blah, blah. That, the owners of that house was a high commissioner of one of the Polynesian islands. And he all of a sudden decided he was going to come home. Mm -hmm. 
So he basically called, you know, I get this phone call and yeah, we're going to come back and we want the house back. And it's like, oh my God. So we had to move. So that's when we moved down the street to Crozier Loop. And we, and we had another really cool house down there that we found. Had a, um, an attic in it. And I, I built this kind of really kind of with a spool table. Oh, shoot. With that's the, all right. With the spool table and stuff. And um, curtains that hang down. I mean, you know, real hippie style stuff. It was yeah. pretty cool. But it was it was a tiny little place, but it was perfect. And it was right on the water. Front. And it wasn't a garage. <laughs> no, it wasn't, it wasn't a garage. <laughs> You're moving up. Yeah. So anyway, we then we decided that we wanted to get out and see the world. And we actually had kind of thoughts of maybe never coming back and living in Europe. Wow. Yeah. And so uh, this, sorry to interrupt, this had to be like 80 something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, um, uh, you guys had, so over we there. pulled the plug and I had to go through this cause I was still in the national guard. And so I, I actually went to the commanding officer and I said, look, this is what we want to do. And, uh, what do you think? And he said, yeah, okay. I'll put you in an inactive, you know, guard unit, which meant I didn't have to go drills. And I have, I had a letter that said, this is, I'm doing this, you know, I'm, I'm allowing him to go. No fuss, no muss. Mm -hmm. So we packed our bags and we left. What, what does that mean, though? You, you you waited until you got there and then you bought a vehicle? Where? When you got to Europe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had neighbors that I grew up with uh, in Long Beach, and they lived in Oslo. So we flew in to Amsterdam, and <laughs> I bought a bread van Volkswagen, no windows, and drove up to Oslo. What color was it? Kind of an off white. Yeah. Yeah. And um, drove up there. It might have been a place called Froniker. And these, these folks had a house, and I went around looking for some wood, and they got a few nails and a hammer, and I built this bed which went across the whole back of the van but underneath it i you know had a little door that it would come up and it had a leg attached to it that i would that was our dining room table <laughs> and then underneath there we had our luggage and all that kind of stuff underneath there so it was it was that's cool. cool but one one day we woke we woke up and um there was like frost inside the van and it's like oh my god we gotta get out of here yeah and, and our itinerary said that we were gonna go to Greece. And so along the path, we're going through Germany and I don't know, all those countries up there we went through and we'd spend a day or two there, but we never really went in. We didn't go to hotels or do anything. We stayed in that van. And uh, what, was that difficult to find places to stay? You just like go to some parking lot and sleep there or? Yeah. Yeah. That was a little sketchy. I got to well, yeah, say. Yeah. You it, could get. It was a little sketchy and we never, that was a hard thing to figure out is where, what kind of dark place, but not too dark place can we yeah. go and not be harassed and so on and so forth. And, you know, we pulled it off a couple of times. Somebody come knocking on the window of a cop or something and they, we showed them our IDs and passports and so on and so forth. And they say, okay. Hippies. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> no, whatever. No, whatever. It wasn't quite like that, but yeah. it's kind of like that. Yeah. yeah. But, but what about the language barrier? You know, it's funny in, in Europe and I ended up living there, as you know, uh, for quite a while. And uh, I always managed to, you can talk a lot without having by hand gestures and just, you know, face emotions and pointing and doing this and that. And, sure. you know, you can have a conversation. It's not easy, but you can do it. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can get your point across basically. And you learned to also, you learn, you know, I had, I had German and in, or in high school and so I did a few things I knew really yeah and Kathy had done new Spanish a little bit you know uh -huh. so when we got in certain countries you, you can bear you know use that but also English is a lot of them could speak a little bit yeah, of English right. so um, so you didn't along that trip trying to make your way down to Greece you didn't find anywhere in Central Europe where you wanted to hang out for more than a couple of days no, because we were kind of, we kind of had a, a vision of where we wanted to go. And it wasn't like we we're going to just hang out. I mean, we didn't know from day to day. It's like get waking up and go, kind of going, okay, what are we going to do today? You know? Yeah. But when you're on the road, we kind of moved, but we kept moving. 
And I can't answer that, honestly, of whether we stayed a day or two at certain places, which is probably likely. I don't really remember that. Yeah. But we moved on down and we ended up in um, Zurich, Switzerland. And we went to a hostel, which was, I think it was one of the first places we'd ever really been indoors, not in the van, you know, living in the van. Yeah. And um, we went in there and we met this couple and they said, yeah, what the hell are you doing going to Greece? You come with us to the Canary Islands. It's like, it's going to be cold in Greece. (laughs) Yeah. So we just, you know, spent the night thinking about it and talking about it. And next morning we took off with them and we headed completely different direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was crazy. We didn't have any contact with anybody for six weeks because all of our mail and everything was going to Greece. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was, it was pretty crazy. But we, along the way, um, Man, along the way, the engine in, in the Volkswagen kind of blew up. So we were in Melk, Vienna, and um, pull into this gas station kind of thing. And this guy goes, yeah, okay, your engine's blown. And, you know, so I, we had him put a new engine in there. Not a new, new engine, but an engine that he pulled out as another one. And, mm-hmm. So by then, the group that we were following to Cadi, which is where the the uh, boat left to go to the Canary Islands. That's in Spain, the tip of Spain. And um, anyway, we were behind them now because we had to stay in milk for the, to get the engine rebuilt and so on. So we got, once I got that thing, man, we just pedal to the metal and trying to get there before the departure of the boat, which only left every week, once a week. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we got there and we got to the little town of Kadi, which was pretty cool. And we we're literally driving the streets looking for this guy's van because he had a red and white Volkswagen van. But his was a real van. It was one of those multi window things. Now, if you had that, it'd be awesome. Yeah. You know? Um, so anyway, we found him and we ended up going to the Canary Islands. And, and we stayed in the coolest hotel ever, the Forgotta Hotel. Takarante was the owner of the hotel. How did you have money? We had, we had money. I would say that we had, you know, a, a few thousand dollars. So you, you, you saved up a little bit, took off and yeah. you could, did you do work along the way? No. No? No. You didn't make but any we money? Didn't, we weren't living high on the hog. I yeah. can tell you that. Yeah. It was bare minimum. I mean. But well, some I just thought about that. This couldn't have been in the 80s. This is before you had your daughters. This would have been the 70s. Yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with <laughs> I, was, I was just sitting here thinking, I'm like, there's no way that happened in the 80s. You didn't have your daughters yet. Yeah. Um, okay, so you make it down to the Canary Islands. And so did you guys ever go to Greece? Or did you yeah. just... Okay, yeah, so you we, did it. We eventually. eventually got there, but there was a lot in between. And so uh, how long was the entire journey? Seven months. Seven months? Yeah. You had enough money to drive through Europe for seven months. Yeah. And you only had to switch the, or fix the car that one time with the new engine? It broke down. There's a lot more stories about the car. So we get to the Canary Islands. We're in this really cool apartment bar kind of thing. You know, the little apartments were up above the bar and restaurant. And, um, God, we spent a Christmas there. It was just, it was the coolest thing. There were... 25 of us, and I think all but four were Canadians, but they were all the same age group, and we just bonded so well. We yeah. would go down to the beach. You had to you had to go on a dirt road to get out to the Forgotta Hotel, which was kind of out on this little spit that came off, and um, we'd walk that and go into the beach. It had a big breakwater wall there, and then above it was the town. And we'd be down on the beach, and we'd be throwing frisbees and playing f- playing volleyball and just having a ball and people started lining up just watching us and we'd always it seemed like we were always going and herd down there and just mess around yeah it was fun and then about i don't know five o'clock at night they shut the power off and we had to take cold showers and we'd heat (laughs) you know water on the stove (laughs) kind of thing yeah but it was so cool it was just so cool and so what made it end like we what, what made it in? Yeah, I mean, you, did you decide at some point that you weren't going to stay there, and you're like, "Hey, we should go back to Hawaii"? Like, what? Oh no, you're way ahead of there. Let me tell a little. Okay, more keep story. going. There's then. a lot keep more. Going. There's a lot more story there. So, and it's kind of fun. Um, 
So with the Canary Islands, we went through Christmas there, and I'm not sure if we were there for New Year's, but maybe. Anyway, we decided to leave, and and basically the van started running crummy again. And so I made a mistake of going into Las Palmas, which was the main city there, and, and telling the guy, oh, yeah, we're trying to get on the ferry to go to Morocco, mm-hmm. um, you know, like the next day or two. So I, I made him a big mistake there because I think, I think the guy just basically screwed me. And uh, we got on the ferry and we went over to, uh, I'm trying to remember where it's, what it's called when you go. There's, there's a little Spanish town basically on the tip of Northern Africa, uh, near Gibraltar, mm-hmm. the Rock of Gibraltar, you can see in you, you know, when you're coming in. And you had to go through that first to get into Morocco. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> Kathy tucked my hair all up and made it look short because I was it was pretty long by then. <laughs> and um and we went across it and like midnight and uh, thinking there would be less traffic and hassle. And it worked. I mean we got in there. And then so then we were in Morocco and well, Mor- what, what did putting your hair up accomplish just to make you look more presentable or something? Well, they were yeah that we had heard stories that they make you cut your hair to get into Morocco, <laughs> and I just didn't want to do it. Well, I wasn't even going to go there. I mean, we weren't going to go into Morocco because I was worried about you know losing Kathy to four camels or something. I, I mean, it was just well, that's, that's such a stupid thing to require someone to do to come to the country like. Well, we like, thought so too. I mean. We didn't. We weren't in Morocco for probably less than a day, and somebody, you know, pro- approaching us in the street with hash, mm-hmm. you know, that you could buy for a dollar. Yeah, you know. So anyway, it was kind of weird, but we uh, Morocco was a terrific experience. It was so un, I mean, third worldish and so different than anything that we've ever seen. I mean, it was really like going back. I don't know, two or 3,000 years in, in history. Yeah. I mean, you look out across a field and you see a guy plowing a field with a stick in the ground and a camel. Yeah. Or a donkey. Yeah. It was just unbelievable. But the, the towns, Essaouira and Agri, 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 Casablanca we went to, and then we ended up in Marrakesh. And once again, the van wasn't working. It was barely working. I'm going across, not not quite the Sahara Desert, but it's really wide open, wide open there. I mean, it's just nothing around when you're going between these towns. It's just out there. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, this thing literally is kind of chugging along, and um, I got out of the car and I, I walked and I lifted up the thing and I just said to myself, "Greg, how are you going to get out of this one?" And I, I don't know. I I did. But. <laughs> I, sp- I put it down and I told Kath, look, as long as the wheels keep turning on this, we're not stopping. Yeah. So we chugged our way all the way to Marrakesh. The Marrakesh Express came by as we were out there. And what is that? That's an old train. You know, mm. Marrakesh it isn't a song, but somebody did. I don't know. You should know that. I don't know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway. Well, the, the language barrier there must have been pretty, pretty difficult, right? I, yeah, well, I we didn't do. They spoke English. We didn't do a lot of talking. Yeah. We well, didn't. and see, that's the other thing is like uh, a lot of those countries that you went through then were far less dangerous than they are now. Oh right? God, yes. Yeah, it was pretty naive, and we were we were extremely naive. But they were no, they were agreeable. I didn't, we never had an incident at all. Although I must say, I think it was Agadir is the word I was looking for. The town I was looking for. We parked on a beach again in the van, just pulled up on a beach. And um, we heard the knock, and I'm just going, oh, my God, you know. So we open it up, and it's just two Bedouin guys, full, you know, they've got the big, long, you know, curved knife in his waist and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. And it's kind of like, hey, you know, come with us. And, like, we kind of talked our way through that, and they had they started a fire. And I'll never forget how this guy, he just pursed his lips and blew out of that. And the, all of a sudden, it just kind of flamed up. I mean, he started as just like an amber. And the next thing you know, he had a fire. Wow. It was just so cool how he did it. And and we just sat there and, I don't know, we smiled at each other. We, you know, tried to say a few words and so on and so forth. But it was quite an evening. I don't remember how it ended, but I do remember 
you know, that, that happened. We were mm-hmm. very nervous about it, but we let ourselves go and mm-hmm. we, it was a good thing to do. That's cool. That, that was really cool. And you also went through Pakistan or Afghanistan? No, no, no. no? But let, let me just finish the Marrakesh thing. So we, we get into Marrakesh and it's late, it's kind of at night and, uh, And we go into a camp. We find out where this camp is. And we drive into this camp and just kind of went a big sigh of relief. I mean, it was just so cool to get into kind of safety, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I mean, it was scary being out in the middle of that desert. And uh, I, I didn't enjoy that at all. I was pretty freaked out. So we get in there. We managed to, you know, get something and calmed our nerves and... <laughs> and uh, from then on, the next day, I started to try to deal with the, the Volkswagen van, and um, I ended up pulling the engine in the camp at Marrakesh. I pulled the engine out one day, and there were a lot of guys and rover, you know, rangers and whatever, desert vehicles, and they had every tool you can imagine. They had torque wrenches and they had compression gauges and they had all this kind of tool metric this metric that and those guys would just stop by and say here oh you need this and they'd go get one and bring it out you know and so they pull the engine out and uh kind of found out what the problem was and that one of the guys there was french and he spoke they they speak french in marrakesh or morocco and huh. um so i went to a junkyard with him and he talked his way in got two heads and went back and uh, ground the valves. I got some grinding compound and like, you know, the little suction chip you used to have on the little arrows that you would do. Mm -hmm. So I ground the valves by hand and I I actually have a photograph of me doing that. And uh, it was a beautiful sunny days and it was phenomenal. I had that, I had that engine back in the next day. So you basically became a, a certified Volkswagen repair technician by the end of this trip. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I know Volkswagen pretty well. Yeah. I had like six of them. Oh, really? <laughs> not not in there, but when even you know even yeah. when I got back to Hawaii and so uh-huh. on and so forth. But yeah. So after that, we headed out of Morocco, going uh, north along the coast, uh, the west coast of. Uh, Africa to the northern Africa and we went through oh man I can't, we were uh, our, we were trying to get to Tunisia and there's Oman I believe is one of the I don't know Oman is not a country what would that have been um, maybe it wasn't at that point but no I think Oman was a town and I can't remember what that is but anyway I drove for a whole lot of hours because I didn't want to stop. Yeah. I didn't want to stop. And that night I drove all night long through a storm, wind blowing, trees were falling in the road and animals I'd never seen before were running around in the road, you know, and went through some, um, uh, checkpoints as you went through these various countries, which you never really knew what was going to happen. Yeah. But for the most part, it worked out pretty good. You know, and we went, we had, we stopped and, I don't know. I wish I could remember this. Oman or, or or something like that. Anyway, we went into a restaurant. I mean, Kathy was a doll, you know, blonde hair and just cute as a bug. And, um, man, we walked in there. I mean, it's like, you know, like you see in these movies, everybody stops and, and take, <laughs> just scary, takes his yeah. looks at you, you know? Yeah. Man. Um, so we went through that and on the menu, we had no idea what we were going to order. And I, yeah. Honestly, I, I'm not positive about this, but I think we ordered a plate of peas. <laughs> so anyway, we weren't about to say, oh, excuse me. Could, you know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we went on and I got back on the road and, and drove to Tunisia where we caught another ferry to go to Sicily. Uh-huh. And then we crossed from Sicily. We drove through Sicily. And ironically, as you know, I ended up living in Sicily five, you know, for five years. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it was kind of interesting and going over, Kathy kept kind of a little journal of mm-hmm. all our travels and so on and so forth. I added to it every now and then, but, um, 
it was, it was, that was a pretty cool thing that we did. But so we drove all the way through Sicily and then we went over to the mainland of Italy and caught, oh man, this is pretty sketchy. I'm not sure how we got up to where we went, but we ended up in Greece. That's where we finally ended up. So that was, that was the ultimate goal. You ended up getting there. Right. And then once you were there, you're just like, what are we going to do? No. No, then we went to a couple of, Igamanetsu, I believe, was one of the islands that we went to and uh, and traveled around to a couple of different islands. And then we went to Athens. Mm -hmm. And um, that is when I got, and I'm not going to go real deep into this whole story, of, but I got, um, quite honestly, uh, orders to put me back in active duty. And I had like four days to get. How, how did you get orders if you didn't have a cell phone or an address? By mail. Well, remember when I said that our mail and everything was going to Greece and we went the opposite direction. So we caught up with a lot of mail in Greece. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that night I wrote a letter and we went to the U S embassy and I sort of filed a grievance. <laughs> And um, said, wait a minute, you know, I had, I had approval from my commanding officer and yeah. so on and so forth. And I actually made a phone call to the to Hawaii. I think I woke the guy up in the middle of the night, you know, like two o'clock in the morning or some crazy thing. But he agreed and he goes, I'll take care of it. You know, I'll, I'll do what I can. And he sent me a letter and he said, look, I, I you know, he, he went with permission. And I authorized it and so on and so forth. So as things began to continue and them trying to <laughs> want to make me a deserter, um, they finally accepted that letter as, and said, okay, but you know, when you, you got to come back and join the National Guard again. So that's, was pretty much the end. And we went from there, we went back to, geez, what was it? Paris and London or something. And then we ended up living, but that kind of, Ended the trip and the vibe was, you know, a little scary. Yeah, it probably ruined the whole. Well, I wouldn't say it ruined the whole thing. But yeah, it would definitely put a new perspective on it. So. But what would if you wouldn't have got that letter? What would you have done? You would have just kept going. Yeah, we would have made it more leisurely. I think we would have spent more time maybe in Paris or London, or you know, maybe done some other things. But we were kind of winding down on it. You know, we'd been out there a long time, and, and money was running short how, how many how many suitcases did you have like were you wearing the same clothes all the time pretty much yeah we had standard you know things that were a lot of we bought a few clothes but very few yeah you know, things bell-bottom jeans that we bought in canary islands yeah i mean you probably didn't buy much anything besides food right no food and gas food and gas and yeah we brought a, ca a cassette uh, thing in, in canary islands you know a little cassette tape recorder kind of thing yeah. so we had music because the van didn't have any music so <laughs> yeah played. i mean what was it like driving was it just insanely boring when you're just cruising no no you guys just talking and looking out i don't the window? i don't i don't remember it being any kind of a negative thing oh this is boring as hell i, I you know we always had somewhere we were going yeah and then the big deal was once you get into these towns i mean it's not like you have google you know, Kathy was looking at the map and, you know, we'd use it. Sometimes we'd try to get to a, <clears throat> I don't know, a post office or some American Express place because that's where a lot of foreigners hung out and communicated with each other. <clears throat> so we'd try to find that and then just navigating around these towns, these, you know, big, it was brutal. It, yeah. I mean, stress level was pretty high <laughs> for me, you know? <laughs> yeah. And nothing, nothing dramatic happened. You never got beat up. You never got <laughs> robbed. Uh, well, no, I wouldn't say that, but uh, not to, I don't want to talk about that either. <laughs> All right. We'll skip that one. Well, it was nothing traumatic, but we had some stuff stolen out of the van. We picked, yeah. up, we picked up some good hitchhikers that kind of ripped us off. Yeah. Or nothing. Took a jacket of mine or something. That was no big deal. Yeah. So what'd you do with the van when you were done? So we ended up in... Um, God, where was it? I guess it was London or Paris. Hmm. I, no, I, I don't know. Well, either London or Paris. We mm -hmm. went back to American Express. I posted this thing up because everybody would sell cars. I was, you know, and I sold the van. How much did you get for it? Oh, I have no idea. How much did you pay for it when you got to Oslo? I have no idea. You don't remember? Mm -hmm. Hundreds of dollars, not thousands, that's for sure. Yeah. 
um, cause we didn't have that kind of money. I mean, in the whole trip, I think we spent less than $4,000. Really? Yeah. Man, that's too bad. And that, was, that included round trip from Hawaii. Yeah. Plane tickets, right? Yeah. Uh, what, what would you give to have that van right now, man? That would be <laughs> yeah. so cool if you still had it. Yeah, it would be. It wasn't a great van though. <laughs> I mean, no windows or anything, you know what I mean? It <laughs> yeah. was just like, hmm. Yeah. If I'd have had a, one of those multi-window things, then that would a keeper. That would be pretty awesome. Uh -huh. I did have, in college, I had a 55, 356 Porsche mm -hmm. with twin taillights. That was pretty cool. cool. I, I bought that car from Brad. Oh, really? Yeah, he had it. Brad is my brother, by the way. For, mm -hmm. anybody, for anybody listening, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I bought that from him. and um, I was, But that was a cool car. Yeah. So yeah, so we're back in Hawaii. Yeah. So yeah. Th that that you think that really like started uh, like a lifelong passion for wanting to go places and see things? Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, it it uh, although, you know, life has a way of moving you in directions that you don't sometimes think you're going to go. Yeah. Um but yeah, I, I think we've always had a great appreciation and I think for both of us it was really a wonderful experience. Life experience. Yeah. But then you, you kind of wanted to go back and settle down. and We ended up, no, nothing ever came at us in terms of jobs. We did try to go a modeling thing. I think we looked at one time. And if, if I like, knew then what I know now about American schools in Europe, that would have been immediately where we would have gone. And we could have still been there by now. You mean you would have become teachers? Yeah. Of English? Yeah, in American schools. Yeah. On, on military bases. Uh, I see. I yeah. see. Yeah. And they're really good schools. Yeah. And uh, they're always, not always, but they're looking for, you know, they get paid well. They have all the conveniences of housing and all the things that I got when I was in Sicily. So mm -hmm. uh, it would have been a good gig for us. And that would have definitely been able to do that if both of us were, could have been teachers. Mm -hmm. But that didn't work out. So we ended up back in Hawaii. Yeah. And we did the house hunt, and that's, whew, boy, now I'm confused on which house that was, but somewhere along the line. But that might be when we got to Crozier Loop. <laughs> I'm really screwing this time. Then we're but talking a, about a long time ago. A long freaking time ago. But um, yeah. then, then we bought the house in Pope Law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah. Kathy would... Got pregnant while uh, uh, while we were in Europe. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, you left that part out. Well, <laughs> yeah. So not too long after we got back, Jennifer came along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so then uh, you you uh, raised your family in Hawaii. Yeah, and I mean, I I want to move there. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> It seems was, like paradise, right? Yeah, it's a really cool place. It's uh, it's expensive, but it it's that's delightful. It's amazing. And you you were always on the island of Oahu. Did did it ever appeal to you to go to a different island? Well, when I first landed in Hawaii, I was in Lahaina, Maui. Oh, really? Yeah, that's where I joined the National Guard. Uh -huh. On that initial coming from California, and um, is there any any like weird? intra island competition you know what i mean like for what just like do the people on oahu are they like uh those maui people or those oh Lanai? no there does there is everybody like a community it's not like one island versus another I, ne I never experienced anything like that yeah competitive or whatever you want to call it kind of between the islands no mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't i don't i never caught that vibe yeah but do, do you think it's changed a lot I mean, it, since the time you got there, what, what what is the biggest difference between then and now? Other than more people live there. Like, has it changed the culture? Well, the cultures, yeah, subtly change. I mean, the Hawaiian cultures are, I guess you'd say, I, I don't mean in a negative way, but they're being diminished you know, because there's so many other influences. The Jap Japanese have a big influence in mm -hmm. Hawaii. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, Hollies are in a minority. Really? Yeah, always have been. And Hali means native. Hali means white. Oh, Hali means white. Non-native. Gotcha. Okay. Non-native. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, the other thing I was thinking of that I wanted to ask you about is the the significance of Pearl Harbor there on the island. You know, it, it was a long time before then. I, you know, yeah. I worked at Pearl Harbor for a lot of years in my career, so I was pretty intimate with that base and so on and so forth. But um, I don't know. I don't, you know. Animosities or what? What are you talking no, about? No, just like um, the I military mean, it, has a huge influence on the island's economy. Yeah, huge. Yeah, and still does to this day because of Pearl Harbor. Because of the military being stationed at Pearl Harbor, yeah, and other bases around there. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the Air Force is there, the Army is there, mm-hmm. and the Navy is there. So, yeah, I wonder. I wonder if that was like one of the main reasons. They wanted to acquire Hawaii because oh, that's, yeah. you know no, what I mean? Logistically, yes. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Right? Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. Yeah, because, um, I mean, that that was part of the reason they tried to get so many of those little tiny, uh, those little tiny islands out in between yeah, Hawaii. Yeah, mid- Midway and Guam. Yeah. and because yeah. they yeah. needed places. They were stepping to, jumps to Japan. Right? Yeah, because they had to refill and. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's interesting. Um, when all the times that I've been there, I never went into any of the uh, the museums or any of that kind of stuff. But it's pretty crazy the role that that played in everything that went down. Do you are you aware of um, the idea that it was allowed to happen so that we could get in the war? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you think that's a thing? Yeah, I think I've always kind of felt that was true. You know, it was a they they were notified that with you know radar was on the mountaintops and and on Oahu. Yeah, and uh, of course I've seen the movies too <laughs> that, that kind of imply that somebody just gaffed them off. It's like, are you kidding me? That's not you know how could that be happening? And next thing you know, there were bombs dropped in Pearl Harbor, but they did see them out there. Yeah. They knew they were out there. Whether somebody said, oh, no, just let them come in. I don't think anybody said that. Yeah. But it, it didn't go well. That's for damn sure. Yeah. I mean, they they sank how many ships? I have no idea. I think uh, it was seven, a- or, seven or eight of them. You can see around Fort Allen is an island in the middle of, of Pearl Harbor. Uh-huh. And um, all the way around, there's sunken ships there. You can see the rusted hulls still. Can, and of course, the Arizona now is a monument, which is, uh, I think there was like 2,500 sailors that died in that. Yeah. yeah. And did they brought that back up? No, it sits on the bottom. It's on the bottom. Yeah. Do they have like uh, scuba tours where you can go down and see it? No. No. There have been people that go down there, you know, but there are military people that are checking things because it still leaks oil out of there. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, you can see the slick on top of the water as you're, you know, the the memorial goes right over the top of it. Mm -hmm. And you're looking down in in the water, but you can't really see much. But you can see the gun turrets kind of breaking water every now and then. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pretty dramatic, but uh, so. Yeah, there's a lot of history there. It's a a cool place. Yeah. Uh, But the other thing I also wanted to get to is um, you, you spent you know, a number of years there, and then you decided to uh, relocate to the island of Sicily, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I took a job there. You took a job there, and it was in Catania, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, that must have been, that must have been a pretty big shock after spending so much time in Hawaii. Yes and no. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not any more of a shock than any place you're not familiar with. I mean, if you're traveling anywhere you're going and, you know, you end up somewhere, well, yeah, this is, you know, <laughs> not, but you're not shocked. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, but yeah, I was, yeah, I mean, it, it, but it was cool. It was just so cool. Every, everything went down really good. And um, I learned to love it. I mean, it's just a really cool place. Another island. I'm an island boy through and through, you know. Yeah. I mean, I live, I live in an island right now here mm-hmm. in James Island. <laughs> yep. Yep. So. Um, so you, you initiated that transfer with the, the military. And th- this is what I was getting at. I thought you did that position for longer before. Because when you were in Catania, you were, you were in charge of, uh, I forget what you called it. It's like the rec center, right? Like, Well, I was the deputy director of the program. Yeah. And so you were in charge of basically entertaining the troops and their families, right? Every base 
in the United, every base in the world has an MWR program, and that's what we are called, Morale Welfare and Recreation. Okay. And um, I started out in Hawaii after <laughs> reading the books and getting my position as a photography instructor, you know, thumbing through the book as I'm teaching my first class. But <laughs> then I had a chance and I applied for a job, a, a real job that was a contractor job at that one. But, um, I mean, it was such a cool craft shop. We did jewelry, we did, uh, you know, pottery, we did woodworking, we did photography and art and painting. I mean, it was just, it was so cool. And you were responsible for deciding what would get funding for and what wouldn't. So, like, if, if you just had an idea, you wanted to do a craft workshop or, or do photography or whatever, you you decided whether or not that would happen, right? You mean later in life? No, no, I mean at at the the base at the MWR in Signella. In Signella. No, it's not quite like that. I mean, these programs are all pretty. Where I might have some input is like when you're developing a budget, you're going to go through all the spreadsheets and figure out how they're doing, and mm-hmm. you know, so on and so forth. You still try to balance the budget. We we operated uh, with non appropriated funds, which means they're non tax dollars mm-hmm. as opposed to appropriated fund dollars, which are our tax dollars. Mm-hmm. So we combined those two, but we always try to operate in a financial, you know, solvency kind of a position. Yeah. We made money. And what it would happen is we had certain divisions of categories like child development centers weren't revenue generators. So we didn't expect them to make money. You know yeah. what I mean? But we had golf courses and other bowling centers and revenue generating nightclubs and so on and so forth. But that all fell under the umbrella. So they were like, and they all Pearl Harbor, there were probably 25 different programs that mm-hmm. all fell under this umbrella. I mean, it, it's, it was a huge operation. Pearl Harbor was, you know, in, in my day, it was a $17 million program. Now wow. it's now that it's combined with the uh, Hickam Air Force Base, God, it's probably $40, 50000000 million. It's just crazy. Wow. I had under my supervision, you know, I had 1,100 employees at one time. Jeez. Yeah. That was in, in Italy or that was in? That was at Pearl Harbor. Okay. Yeah. 1,100 people. Yeah. I mean, not directly responsible for them, but all the people that, you know what I mean? Yeah. That were all under my. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Huh. Tutelage or something. Yeah. And so I came over and saw you yeah. in, uh, in uh, 2003. January, 2003, Mm -hmm. I came to see you over there. And the thing, I mean, I was impressed with a ton of stuff, but one of the coolest parts was seeing how you had become friends with some of the locals and you had a connection and we don't have to say his name, but you had a connection with a guy who I don't mind saying his name. (laughs) Tommaso, you had a connection with him and he, if you can talk about like, he was like ingrained. Oh my God, the guy. He could get anything you wanted. Absolutely anything you want. Yeah. And there are extremes that I could go into, which I wouldn't do, but he can get you anything you want. We would have visitors, uh, you know, military visitors and others that would come in and we'd always take them into town and show them around to us. So there was an admiral that was visiting us and, and Tommy was always the escort. He was the guy that drove the van and, you know, we went around town and we'd, we'd taken this one guy and, um, we're coming back after a day going out Mount Atten and going all around, you know, the island, not all around the island. The island is very big. And, um, but we're going down this old road coming back to the base and we're driving along in the van and all of a sudden there's a guy standing in the street going like this, you know, and we're going, oh, great. Now what's happening, you know? So Tommaso, you know, slows the van down and, and says to the Admiral, roll down the window and, uh, <laughs> He rolls down the window. This guy's got this big fish. And he hands us to hands us to us through the window. <laughs> and so so also ended up cooking that and we just had a great <laughs> night. It was really cool. He was like he was infamous, infamous. On, on a number of levels, right? Oh my God. It was yeah. And if you ever had a situation in Sicily, the first man you go, he had a car stolen from him. His personal car was stolen Someone from him. Someone got whacked. He had it back the next day. Really? Yeah. He had it back the next day. Oh, I'm sorry. We, oh, boy, we screwed that one up. Yeah. 
Yeah, he was accused of being in the mafia. Well, that, that's on, where I was on, going. A number of times, but nobody could, you know, I, I never thought he was. He, yeah. he had connections. There's no yeah. doubt about that. Well, did you get any hints of that? Maybe not from him, but in general, anywhere at all? Did you get... About the mafia? Yeah, did you get the feeling that somebody else was in charge of things? Oh, the mafia was active. Yeah. They were active. With that, it's the, the mafia, in my opinion, it, it was the social cops. In other words, they, they kept society kind of in tune. And they had a, a way of just like, you know, you screw up. Or, you know, we're, we're going to, I mean, crime there was nothing. You could walk the streets of Catania at midnight and nobody's going to touch you. Yeah. But petty theft, there was always a little petty theft kind of stuff, but nothing serious ever. Yeah. It was really cool. But the, the mafia was for real. We had a one of the uh, contractors that ran a pizza place for us next to the bowling alley, you know. And <laughs> we picked up the new morning newspaper and there were... 13 mafia people and he was one of them that was picked up oh serious <laughs> yeah so his wife ended up you know taking over the pizza joint yeah, yeah. taking over the pizza joint yeah i mean it's it's got to be like such a far-reaching institution that everybody just gets involved at some level yep. whether or not they want to and i mean i get it like you get protection you get uh you get guaranteed uh items or or whatever yeah. but you got to kick kick down some money yeah. and play the game yeah it, it wasn't it was never that obvious to neophyte i mean to us you know what i mean mm -hmm. i think all italians know what's out there you know? well and it's a different presence on the island versus the mainland right aren't they different families well uh, to my knowledge which is not great but i i believe it started in sicily i believe that's true yeah yeah and then and you know how far into mainland italy i'm not sure it went uh -huh. huh but, but that that was uh that was a cool time for sure and you you got to experience a bunch of things and eat eat a bunch of delicious food and then when i came over you got to share that with me too and i remember we went to uh your landlord's uh, Rosario. Rosario. We went to his, I think it was his personal house. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And they invited Lentini. us over in Lentini. Yeah. And they made for us a traditional Italian dinner, which yeah. was like. Eight or ten. You know. <laughs> it was just one thing after another. I know. And she was just like a, a large, uh, classic Italian woman. She kept scooping more spoonfuls of noodles on my plate. I'm like. Yeah. I'm full. I can't yeah. eat anymore. Well, they would do that for me every weekend because, mm -hmm. you know, I lived in that house there. That It was their house. It was such a cool house. Yeah. And uh, Graziella was her name mm -hmm. on Rosario. And uh, she apparently designed that house. Oh, really? And they, they lived down below. And then I lived in this little th little house with its pitched roof. And I, I swear, uh, my head was bloody for the first, you know, six weeks because the the roof line in the kitchen came down and if you walk to one side of the kitchen you're going to hit your head <laughs> and it was like living in the attic and we yeah had to, and you know there was one door that was only that tall mm -hmm. it was just crazy but it was such a cool house it had three decks on it and um beautiful deck out front you open the doors up and you you know you're looking at mount Etna and the bay of catania yeah. spectacular view. it was gorgeous it was really gorgeous then there was a deck above that, which was kind of like a sun deck up on the top. And then there was another um, back deck that looked up kind of to the mountain, sort of. Mm -hmm. And um, the shower was one a typical Italian shower where, you you know, if you drop the soap, you're kind of in trouble. It's hard to bend over. <laughs> They're so yeah. tiny, yeah, right. you know. So I, I started talking to Rosario because there, there was actually a door adjacent to the shower that went out onto that back patio and i said you know we're sorry it'd be kind of cool if you just extended the wall of the shower across to that door and that door would then be in the shower yeah so damn if he didn't do it <laughs> so i ended up um getting an extended hose off the shower head you know and i would take showers out on that back deck nice yeah it was really cool nice it was really cool plus the shower got twice as big you know yeah but that was that was really neat yeah what did, obviously, they were all very good, genuine people that you interacted with. Did you ever get the impression that they they liked that you were involved with the American military and somehow that was a good thing for them? 
This just popped in my head right now. No, I, n- I never. Um, it's it's interesting. That the, the civilians in general had this mentality that you know in the U.S. we live to work uh-huh. and they work to live. Yeah. And that was pretty true. They they took their you know they did their jobs okay, and they were you know some of them better than others, just like anywhere else you go. Mm-hmm. But they never really took it too seriously. They just were there for a paycheck, and their real life was once they got outside the gate again. Sure. But they were all cool. Not all of them, but I mean they were very cool people, and they all spoke perfect English. Yeah. So that was never an issue. Well, yeah, and the other thing that really blew my mind when I came there is they they have them. A- just like what you said, they they uh, work to live. They they have such a bigger focus on family mm-hmm. and uh, eating as an event. Yeah, I, I, I was so shocked when I you know went started going around the country and checking everything out, and I'd go, I'd see the hours for a shop, and it'd be like ten a.m. to one fifteen, mm-hmm. and then they'd be off. For two, two and a half, three hours, yeah. then they'd open back up yep. because they were taking lunch. Yep. They're taking three hour lunches, right? which blew my mind. We would go into town, you know, Americans, you know, friends, we would go into town to have dinner and, and we'd go in there, I don't know, seven, eight o'clock and we'd always try different restaurants and we heard, you know, uh, Tomaso tell us to go try this and do that. And we'd go into Catania. Catania is really a cool town, very cool. Uh, and... We'd be in there at seven, eight o'clock, and we'd walk in. There's like nobody in there, and we're just kind of feeling sorry for him. We'd sit down at the table, you know, and order a bottle of wine and order dinner. And by, I don't know, I would say by maybe nine o'clock, man, that restaurant started filling up. And before we left, it was packed. Right. But they always ate dinner late. Yeah. But the same thing, uh, the same thing happened when I went to Madrid. Yeah. I went to a a restaurant with my buddy. It was like eight or nine o'clock at night, dead. Mm -hmm. It was packed by like 10 o'clock. Yeah. They eat so much later. Yeah. Well, that's because of that siesta, you know. (laughs) I think that's just where they go home and make babies myself. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. But, uh, yeah, it was an interesting culture, but I, I don't know. It worked well for me. I really, it was a, it was a great experience, really great experience. Mm-hmm. And I got to travel so much, man. I traveled around a lot. I got to go to Egypt, which was absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. I, I've been a pharaoh geek since I was a little kid and first, you know, heard about them or read about them and all that kind of stuff. And I actually go there and four days on the Nile and three days in Cairo. And, uh, man, seeing all those Beautiful, the pyramids, of course, but other places, Karnak, and mm-hmm. was, everything is so much more accessible in Europe. You you can you can take a, a three hour plane ride. Oh, yeah. to like a hundred different amazing locations. Yeah, you can be in another culture and another language in an hour. Yeah, not from Sicily, but you know, depending yeah. on where you're living. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I went to a place called Cinque Terre. Oh my God. Yeah. It is the most beautiful thing ever. Mm-hmm. That's it, where Jennifer came and traveled with me there. Uh, yeah, I went there that trip, and then I went there again with my mom. Yeah. Um, most people didn't know about it back then. No, I was... I, I mean, not compared to now. No, I agree. I'm, yeah. I'm not disagreeing with oh, you. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it blew up now, and I don't know... Yeah, I don't probably, know that it would be the same thing. No, it, it would probably be hard, but boy... Um, Julia and I had a great time there. Yeah. Matter of fact, our itinerary, so to speak, we had gone to Florencia, mm-hmm. and uh, that was awesome. That's a beautiful town. Mm-hmm. You can walk the town, you know, and go see the David mm-hmm. and uh, the Duomo, and it's a walking town, and it's, it's just really beautiful. Um, gosh, I forgot what I was going to say now. So, on the on the trip up there through the mainland, yeah. Getting to Cinque Terre. Getting to Cinque Terre after Florence. Then you get on a train. You go to um, La Spitzia and mm-hmm. catch another train. You got to get on the smaller train to yeah. ride up the coast. Yeah. Right. Go through Pisa. Took took a break. It was like a two-hour layover. Catch a taxi cab. Run to see Pisa. You do the classic, you know, leaning yeah. pose. And um, yeah. hop back on the train and then go to Cinque Terre mm-hmm. and hike the 
trails between the five towns there was just so cool yeah so yeah there's nothing else like it yeah. it's pretty crazy so anyway as i was saying we had an itinerary that we were going to go to venice and we were having so much fun and it was just so cool and cinque terre we just said screw it you know and we're not going and we just stayed there and paddled we actually paddled uh, kayaks mm -hmm. going to caves and and stuff and swim in the water which is i mean the Mediterranean Sea is, is the clearest ocean I've ever seen. Yeah. It's just so freaking clear. Mm -hmm. It's mind-boggling. I mean, you could see a dime in 50 feet on the bottom. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's just it's just amazing. Huh. Really cool. Yeah. That, that's my favorite part about traveling alone is you don't have to follow the path that you thought you were going to follow. You can mm. get somewhere and decide that it's really cool and you're going to hang out longer yeah. or you can go to Pisa, yeah. take that picture and be like, there's nothing else here. Yeah. I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah. Italy is, is cool. I, I want to get back there. Um, but, uh, so this, this career with the, uh, United States military yeah. allowed you to live in like some of the coolest places in the world. Absolutely. And I mean, you, you you can just put in for a transfer after X amount of years. Or you can apply for a job anytime you want. Really? And that's what I did. I mean, at one time I had five applications in. Matter of fact, when I was leaving Sicily, I had uh, five applications, one in Crete, one was in, uh, oh gosh, I don't, I don't remember. You were going to go to Bahrain too, weren't you? That was one of the options. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, but then I ended up coming back to Hawaii and that's where I applied for the job in Charleston. Gotcha. And uh, this is the one I got. Yeah. And so you've been here for, what did we figure out? 10 years? 2008. 12 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I just got here yesterday and I've never been here and I'm hanging out with you and it feels like all the places you've ever lived. You know yeah. what I mean? It's there's just a little bit of me and a lot of this. Yeah. It's just like, there's always a breeze coming off an ocean Yeah, and uh, it's always warm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, like you found your your climate. Yeah, this is very similar climate to Sicily, actually. Yeah, it really is. Mm -hmm. Hawaii is, stands alone, though, and yeah. as far as climate and temperature is just the trade winds blowing all the time. You know, mm -hmm. this place has has uh, seasons, very definitive seasons. Yeah, and uh, I like all of them except summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I used to love summer. I mean, you know, I've got skin issues to prove it you know yeah um but it's uh it's it's really nice here did that ever bother you when you lived in hawaii that well, it's basically the same season all the time no i never thought of it that and no? you know the longer you live there there are, there there are subtle changes yeah i mean you know when winter's coming on the north shore when the surf starts rolling in at 30 feet yeah and you know if you live close to the ocean it's like a fog but it's Oh, you know, salt water here, <laughs> misting, blowing off the mountain. I mean, you know, and it's it's a little bit cooler. And then in the summertime, it flattens out and it gets pretty hot. I mean, Kathy's been talking about, you know, global changing and how they've had, you know, 90 plus days, which used to be rarities. Now, yeah. now it'll be around, you know, for a couple of weeks, a month or whatever. Hmm. Yeah, it's because it's typically, typically like 82, 84, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. like smooth. With, trade, with trades 10 to 15. Yeah. Blowing every day. Uh -huh. Yeah. I lived in Phoenix for um, eight months and I hated it when I was there. I <laughs> yeah. was there from March to October. Yeah. And so it was hot. Mm -hmm. And the reason I hated it, I was only 20, 21. Mm -hmm. I hated that I knew I was going to wear the same thing every day. <laughs> yeah. I knew I was going to wear shorts and a t-shirt. Yeah. And then as I get older... And I go to Hawaii and, you know, other places like here where it's just warm. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I could, I could get used to shorts and a t-shirt every day. I don't yeah. know why I hated that when I was 21. That sounds awesome. It's easy to pack for going there. Yeah. I'm telling you, man. Yeah. It's not hard at all. Mm -hmm. You well, know, yeah. you know, you're not going to wear long pants no matter what time it is. No, my favorite part about going there is just wearing board shorts <laughs> all day, every day. Yeah. You get wet, you just dry off. Yeah. No big deal. I mean, working, I didn't, uh, you know, I had what they call Aloha tire. Yeah. So long pants, of course, and then some kind of shirt. Yeah. But not coat and tie stuff ever. Yeah. You know? So yeah. That, that made it comfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was pretty cool. So I had some really wild experiences uh, that relate to the military thing. I, I got to do a, a, 
what do they call it? Um, I landed on the deck of an aircraft carrier and it was caught, you know, there. So you, you'd go from about 120 miles an hour to zero in like 2.3 seconds. <laughs> In an airplane. In an airplane. You're talking about when it comes in and the rubber band thing catches it? Yeah, it's not a rubber band, though. It's yeah. a big cable about that big. And um, That's yeah. terrifying. It was wild. And then I did a catapult takeoff. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It was it was, it was just a thrill. I just loved it. You just did it to do it? it, it well, I got invited to go, yeah. Mm. And um, there was, the CEO had given a few... <sighs> you know, family members and others that could go. And, mm -hmm. and I happened to be one of them. Yeah. So it was, it was quite a great experience. They, they treated us like Kings. I mean, we got to, you know, the CEO gave us hats. I got a hat that's got all the scrambled eggs on it and my name on the back of it. They <laughs> give you a folder that shows that you did this catapult nice. and the rest thing. And, nice. Yeah. It's, it was pretty cool. And I also got to fly in a, when I was in National Guard, I got to fly in a F-104 fighter jet which was with the national guard air national guard in hawaii which is an old death wing jet is you know it's old now but anyway the one right. that doesn't have any right angles no 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 this is old time stuff okay no that's a that's like a stealth yeah that's something. a stealth thing that didn't yeah. come out until you know i know but so anyway i got to ride in this thing and uh got all suited up and stuff and we took off from Honolulu and went out over uh, Haleakala, and it, they called it a photographic mission. So I had my camera with me, and there were two other jets flying with us. So we did a barrel roll, kind of upside down. So I was shooting down through the top of, you know, the uh, canopy with these two guys flying with a uh, background of Haleakala in it, and uh, uh, that was really cool. And we got then when we got on the backside of, of uh, Haleakala. We're out there, and, and he looks down, and he sees this little this fishing boat out there. So he goes, "This is cool," you know. He says, "I like doing this." So we dive down on this guy, and you and you can see this guy's down on the fantail of his fishing boat out there, getting he <laughs> knows what's coming, you know. Yeah. So he just kind of stand there like this, and then he jumps on it and puts in the afterburners, and we just took off for this guy. I mean, Whoa. it was really, really cool. And uh, he let me fly the plane. I did a barrel roll. Because there's there's two sticks. Yeah. 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 You did a barrel roll. I didn't do the foot, you know, stuff, but I did I did the stick. And uh, and what do you do for that? Just like pull it. He said, "Well, you pull back on it, and then you just throw it over." And uh -huh. I did one, and he said, "Well, you know, that was okay. We came out headed towards the ocean, you know." But he says, "You know, whip it faster." So we did it again. And I pulled back and threw that thing over, and it was like, <laughs> and then I threw up everywhere. <laughs> nah, I, 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 did okay. I did okay. It didn't make you sick at all. No. no? Yeah, the, the margin for error error has got to be so small to land that thing. On a carrier. On a carrier. The the How long is the runway? Like 100 yards? Oh, no. It's, well, yeah, not, yeah, probably not 100 yards. You know, I think it's 100 yards. That's or, insane. Or more. I, that's a good question. Google it. <laughs> yeah. I usually have a laptop set up. I didn't do it this yeah. time. Uh, yeah, man. When you see that happen, you're just like... You can't mess that up. And I, I've never seen video of somebody crashing one. It's like they land it every time. Oh, I've seen pictures of them crashing. Yeah. Yeah. Those are like $20 million planes. Yeah. That's a, that's a bad boo-boo. Yeah. That's not a good thing. Yeah. Not a good thing. Yeah. But. Uh, so I, I wanted to end on, uh, I mean, you... You had this this life where you didn't anticipate going into the army. You um, got drafted, and am I using the wrong word when I say army? I always, no, I was in the army. Okay, I always mix up all the words. Military. I worked army. for the navy, but I was in. I, yes, in, you were in the navy. Yeah, um, I was. No, I worked for the navy. You worked for the navy. I was in the army. Yes. Okay. I, I don't use the terms the correct way, but you you got drafted and sent to do this. You kind of delved into the counterculture and then kind of, it always seemed to me that your personality was not really a part of what you would expect that type of person to be. And you still remained in it for 37, Eight years. 38 years. And so basically I just wanted to ask you, for the course of that time, was it was it positive 
did you feel like it was a good thing? Like, do you have any, do you have Oh, negative? no, it was, it was very positive. Yeah? It was challenging to work. I mean, I never knew from day to day what was going to happen. I mean, I had certain scheduled things that I got to go to a department head meeting or do this or do that, but I never know who was going to walk in the door next. And I mean, it was all managers of different, you know, facilities and programs. And, and they, you know, I was the problem solver. I mean, they'd come in and say, Greg, you know, da, 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 what, mm-hmm. you know, should we do this or what do you want to do or blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And we talk about it or go fix it or whatever. I mean, it was a very complex job and you never did the same thing every day. That's cool. Yeah, it was really cool. And, so, you know, it was, it was a little bit challenging with some personalities, military in particular. Sure. But, you know, most of the people that I ran into, with very few exceptions, that we got along just great. And it was, mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was really a very positive experience. Cool. Yeah. It, it, nobody viewed you as like the 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 square peg in the round hole. You no. Were, no. You were, you, even though you may have had different uh, morals or different ideas of what. Yeah. Yeah. You still, you had a job to do and you did it. Yeah, but it wasn't quite that bad. I mean, I lived, I lived the life. I walked the walk. I tried mm-hmm. to, you know. So, I mean, gosh, we did so many things for families. We, God, I can't tell you how many Fourth of July things that we've done. You know, mm-hmm. we did, and it, we did it big. I mean, we did, we did a lot of stuff. Yeah. And and uh, at Pearl Harbor, we hosted uh, unlimited hydroplane racing. Yeah, for ten years we did that, <laughs> and you know we'd set up corporate tents all along the waterfront and i mean it was it was a big deal yeah two hundred and fifty thousand dollar prize for the winning boat and really yeah and this is just for people enlisted no it this was is for, for the whole one everybody in hawaii was invited oh i see i mean we were trying to make money yeah we lost our ass <laughs> and finally in the 10th year it's just like we had to go to the governor the ceo had to go to the governor to say look enough because we MWR was taking the hit. We were, mm-hmm. we were the one that was paying for it for the most part. Yeah. Some of those things are worth it. If it, if it does a good thing for the community and you yeah. can, you can write it off as something else, it yeah. doesn't always necessarily have to make money. But then if you're the one in charge of the program and you have to justify it, then yeah. I well, kinda... it's a different scenario. I mean, we you know, we deal with what we call sailor dollars and to have sailor losing sailor dollars that weren't necessarily going all to sailors, that was, you know, and I say sailors, I mean their families as well. You know? Yeah. Um, so that's where we won the battle, so to speak. You know, we can't keep spending money like this. Yeah. It's just not fair because it's coming out of our budget, you know? Yeah. So that went away. But it was it was a good party while it lasted. Yeah. It was I'm really bad. fun doing that. But it was a big, big project. Mm-hmm. I mean, we'd spend six weeks prior just working for that. Yeah, I mean, I imagine you have to get a bunch of permits and... No, no permits. No? No. The Navy owns it. It's their property. <laughs> <laughs> we do what we want. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess it makes it easy in that yeah. respect. Fort Island is all Navy, you know, so... Fort Island is an island in the middle of Pearl Harbor, so... Uh-huh. That's where we did it. Did you ever Did you ever go somewhere and you had a task or something and somebody tried to stop you and you're like, showing the badge... Anything like I that? Have, I don't have any badges. <laughs> you know what I mean, though. Like no, I, you got I, to pull rank on a regular person. No, no, nothing no. like that. I mean, I, I mean, there might be situations where I don't know, as a senior manager, where I might have to tell somebody to do something, but that mm-hmm. was another employee or something. Yeah. Uh, the only military attachment really was through um, the CEO's office and all the department heads that were both civilian and military. But we'd meet once a week. In a big room and around a table, and yeah, see, I would say, so what's going on this week? You know, mm-hmm. did you were you ever upset with the direction it was going as a whole, or no? I didn't get. I mean, the military side of things, I, even though I had a secret, you know, clearance, I, I I never really got into any kind of the military stuff and what they were doing and all that kind of things. You know, you had a secret clearance, yeah, to do what? To be secret. I to, can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to edit this part. Yeah. No, uh, you could see classified documents. Is that what you mean? Secret. Yeah. That's not the highest form of. What's the difference? Well, there's classified uh-huh. 
and then there's secret, and then there's the next level of secret. I don't know what top secret, uh-huh. and then there's a, another above that. Uh, I don't know how high it goes. Wow. Yeah. So you were shown something at some point that other people. Didn't well, I just know. heard things that were going on. Yeah. It, it's you know one of the things that's important is that you don't talk about like ships. I was involved a lot of times with ships coming in and out of Pearl Harbor, but you know you're not supposed to talk about it. Yeah. And you send messages and so on and so forth. So I had information about when ships were coming in the harbor. Mm-hmm. And that in itself is classified information. Sure. So you come home from work and Kathy's like, hey, which ships are coming in tomorrow? Yeah, right. You're like, I can't tell you. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, if you, really want, <laughs> if you really wanted to know, you go to a taxi cab in Honolulu and um, they'll tell you. They'll tell you when the ships are coming in. They know because they're transporting. Hey, man, don't ask me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just know that they know. Oh, they didn't wow. get it from me. but Cool. All right. Well, I think that's a good spot to shut it down. So thank you for doing this. All right. Well, awesome. thank you for having me. Yep.